So joining us today is the author of um, The Scent of Scandal, and his name is Craig Show Pittman. Here. <laughs> yep, here it is. We got our we got the paper copy. Uh, Craig has uh, been a writer uh, for Florida's largest newspaper and probably most respected newspaper. I shouldn't say that coming from Miami, but I'm going to the Tampa Bay Times. Um, and he um, is a native Floridian. He was born in Pensacola and has been a writer uh, in Florida for many, many years, since 19 or something like that. <laughs> um, he's won many awards uh, and has written some amazing titles that we love. Um, the State You're In, Florida Men, Florida Women, and Other Wildlife, uh, Cattail about the Florida Panther, Paving Paradise about the wetlands, uh, Manatee Insanity about manatees, and Oh, Florida, How America's Weirdest State Influences the Rest of the Country. And Craig, I, I, I do get an opportunity to travel and it's really funny when people start um, bashing on Floridians and I'm like, bash away. Uh, that's low hanging fruit, you know. Yeah. Florida, Florida man is a real thing and Florida woman is a real thing. But I, I, when people talk like that, I feel like they don't really understand the real Florida. Well, it's, it's not the whole story. It's not the whole story. And so that, that's the point I was making in Oh, Florida was, you know, yeah, there's a lot of weird stuff that happens here, but also a lot of stuff that affects the rest of the country. And you should know about both sides. of it. Great. So to to learn more about uh, Craig's um, books, um, please visit CraigPittman.com. Um, and he has a, a wonderful podcast and uh, he always has daily posts. I understand Donald DePew says he's got great posts. Uh, he's always I know. <laughs> They make, the, he says the music, the jokes and the environmental causes make his day. So, um, <laughs> so head on over to craigpittman.com to find out uh, what other things that you can read and to check out his podcast and maybe go ahead and um, go ahead and sign up for his daily or his weekly newsletter as well. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, Craig, you've written on a lot of subjects that we, as we just looked at, uh, how do you choose the stories that you want to write about? Um, well, uh, you know, when I was with the, the Tampa Bay Times, uh, obviously I'd work with my editor to pick which ones to cover. Uh, but uh, since I left the Times in uh, March of 2020, and now I write a weekly column for the Florida Phoenix, and I'm kind of my own boss now. I, I can pick, pick and choose what I want to write about. So, uh, you know, and, and I freelance stories for various magazines. So I basically kind of write about whatever I find interesting. Um, uh, not too long ago, I got really interested in the fact that there are uh, a number of women who go out hunting pythons in the Everglades for the state. So I did a, a long piece for Flamingo magazine called The Ladies of the Glades about these really interesting women who go out and hunt pythons professionally. Um, and they come from every kind of background you can think of. Um, uh, I did a, a column for the Florida Phoenix about the ghost orchid and how it's, you know, even though it's probably the most famous flower in Florida, it's not protected. It doesn't have any sort of legal protection under the Endangered Species Act. So I wrote a piece on that. Uh, it's just anything that I find interesting and I can convince an editor is worth writing about. I did a piece for the Washington Post uh, in the sort of at the height of the pandemic about how Florida's many nudist resorts were dealing with the pandemic because at one 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 person said yeah now we can't just go nude we have to at least wear a, a mask <laughs> which is made for some interesting interesting sunburns I guess right. <laughs> did you have to go visit any nudist colonies for research no fortunately I did not I'm not sure my eyes would have recovered from <laughs> from that <laughs> i was driving north on uh 41 uh north of tampa and with a friend and i pointed down i was like that's the nudist that's the nudist resort and they're like how do you know i was like well i, I heard i read it in a magazine florida has more nudist resorts than any other state and uh uh when i when i was working at the times at one point in in the run-up to one of the hurricanes my job was to call around to places and ask are you accepting uh, evacuee. So I called one of the nudist resorts, a place called Caliente, and asked, are you accepting hurricane evacuees? And they said, yes. And the good news is you don't have to pack any clothes. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah. So there's, there's, um, there's no shortage of material in Florida, is there? No, I will never run out of Florida stories to tell. I mean, every, and I'm still, you know, I, I feel like I know a lot more than the average Floridian and I'm still finding stuff I, I didn't know before. And it just amazes me. 
Right, great. Um, so th this is the, to the left there is the ghost orchid that you mentioned mm -hmm. that is not protected, which is, uh, which is fascinating. And one of our mm -hmm. readers from um, Southwest Florida during our, while we were reading, um, went out to the Fakahatchee Strand and saw the ghost orchid blooming. Um, wow. And, and and kind of got the group excited about that. That's great. Uh, did did so, they tell you that there there's an easier way to see one? No. Uh. -uh. How was that? You, you, you don't have to go into the fact to see it. You go to the Corkscrew Swamp Sanctuary run by Audubon of Florida, and go about a mile down the boardwalk and turn to your left. And if you brought some binoculars, you can see one growing in a cypress tree just off the boardwalk. Beautiful. Um, yeah. And and it's what they call a super ghost orchid. So it doesn't just put out a single bloom, it blooms repeatedly throughout the summer. So when I saw it, it had five blooms on it. It was, wow. it was amazing. Yeah, it was amazing. Well, I've never seen it blooming in captivity. I saw it blooming at um, RF Orchids down in Homestead, mm -hmm. um, you know, where I'm from down there. And, right, um, yeah. And oh, so some, someone's asking if I can give the location again. It's the Corkscrew Swamp Sanctuary near Fort Myers. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they, when you go in and tell them I'm here to see the ghost orchid, they'll give you directions. But you should bring a, uh, uh, binoculars or, or a telephoto lens or something. It's hard to see with the, with the naked eye, but once you have some magnification, it's much easier. So the Corkscrew Sanctuary, Cork, which Corkscrew is run by Swamp, the Audubon, by Audubon, right. Audubon mm -hmm. Society. Yeah. 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 Corkscrew All right. Swamp. That's everyone's homework to get out to the Corkscrew <laughs> Swamp and check it out. Melissa, I think it's you. blooming right now. I think it's blooming right now, in fact. Awesome. That's great. Good, good. I hope everyone has an opportunity to get out there. So um, this is the, and the other photo is the Phragmopedium covacii, the beautiful mm -hmm. flower, which unless you have the hands holding that bloom, <laughs> you don't really have a sense of it's how huge. gigantic yeah. it is, you know, the yeah. scale. But these are two very famous orchids, one that grows here in Florida and one that was the subject of the book. Um, so for those of you who read the book, which I am hoping that many of you did, uh, the line between collected for protection and protected from collection is hotly contested, especially when it comes to endangered species. And so if you wanted just to pop into the chat box for sake of discussion, uh, do you feel species are safer in the wild or in collections? And well, while people are doing that, um, Craig, do you have an opinion on this? Uh, I think it depends. I mean, you know, ideally you'd want them to be safe in the wild because that's where they belong. That's where they grow. They're part of the ecosystem. If you pull them out of the ecosystem, you know, it's like a, a like like playing Jenga. Who knows which one will be, make the whole thing collapse if you pull it out. Um, but uh, the problem that we saw with this particular orchid and with orchids in general is that nothing protects their habitat. The protections are for the individual flowers and so there are regulations on their uh, commercial trade but not on you know not on trying to save them in the place where they grow so if you see a, a bulldozer coming that's going to build a road through a stand of you know fragmentediums and uh and you go to move them you know that's uh you know you're okay doing that but if you then try and sell them to somebody then you run afoul of the law. And it, theoretically, the better idea would be to protect the habitat first, you know, and maybe not have a bulldozer coming along that, that's going to flatten all of them. <laughs> well, I guess with the ghost orchid, the habitat is protected. Um, and so that's a, that's an example. But so yeah. um, let's see what our crowd well, says here. Well, our it's, it, the habitat's protected, but there are poachers who keep going in there and stealing them. Yeah. And so that's been a big problem. And of course, uh, climate change is a problem as well because it's changing yeah. the temperature of the area where they grow and they, they require very specific conditions to grow. Yeah. So m most of our group is saying that they are better off in the wild. Wild if protected in the wild, says Cheryl. Diane says in the wild. Cindy says safer in the wild in their own environment. Remove the humans. Mm -hmm. Um, Sharon Jones if says only. in the wild, yeah. Um, Debbie says, I'd say in the wild, that's their environment. Um, Gail Gothier says, unfortunately, they seem to be safer in collections. So Gail says safer in collections. I, I probably say a little of both. Um, you know, there should be, especially with the um, benefit of micropropagation, yes. it would be a great idea to, to have both, but really to protect 
um, to protect the um, environment where they are in is my yeah. humble opinion. That's so, the ideal. Yeah, definitely. Okay. So Sally Mazzi says also in the wild. So we are mm -hmm. good there. All right. So the next um, uh, image is of the Phragmopedium Cavacii. That is its name. They're not changing the name. That is how <laughs> taxonomists do things um, in the in the wilds uh, on a car in Peru. And then I believe the figure two was the photo that was taken in at Selby Gardens. Is that correct, Craig? No, that's uh, Lee Moore's wife's hand. Uh, and do you it. say her name Shady or Chady? Uh, Chadi. Chadi. Okay. Chadi. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, very interesting folks. Uh, I've had dinner with her and Lee one night in Miami and they actually got into a really big argument over, uh, over whether the one character in the book who dies, whether he was murdered or, or committed suicide. And people were people and other people in the restaurant were actually looking over at us like, what's, what, what's going on with those folks? What's, what's, what are they talking about? It so was, what, so and did was, they, and I was did like, I was kind of slinking down. That was kind of slinking down under the table. Um, so did they Lee, think he committed suicide? Uh, if I remember right, Lee was arguing that he thought he uh, he thought he committed suicide and she was arguing that he was murdered. So and they they both had very strong opinions about that and and reasons for thinking that. And but they couldn't come to any conclusions. So, well, that was a real shame. And I didn't really see that coming. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and it was fun because the way you write, you know, in between the chapters or in between the chapter breaks, you would kind of set us up, you know, they were yes. like, well, but there's more. And we never got that there was going to be a potential suicide or, you right. know, that was, that was quite unexpected. And I feel very bad for, for that family. And I, and I wrote, I wrote this book differently than I wrote my two previous books. Um, I was purposely trying to make it more like a murder mystery. Uh, so I used shorter sentences and I made sure every chapter ended with a sort of a, a cliffhanger that would make you want to read on to the next chapter. And as a res I'm assuming as a result of that, um, on, on the back of the book, this book is, as far as I know, it's the only one like this, classified as true crime slash gardening. I love it. <laughs> I love it. And I noticed in the acknowledgments, you gave a shout out to my friend Neville Parker. Um, yes. And she's a, she's quite a gardener herself. Um, so she's a real fun lady. Oh, but, yeah. Well, she designed um, she designed the cover that very eye catching cover. She's she's got quite an eye. Definitely. She's a very kind lady. Mm -hmm. um, so about the uh, the the writing style, um, mm -hmm. you know, you really um I thought it was great the way you did it as a murder mystery because you really captured a lot of the dates and that timeline. I could see how um, how important and, and kind of reportery it felt like that you were kind of really reporting the facts as they were, but you yep. still blended that intrigue um, mm -hmm. and that page turning into it. So um, I'm glad that you, you know, there was a de design behind that. So I don't Thanks. know if you want to talk any more about that. Well, um, uh, and I, I wanted to kind of give the readers a little bit of the sense of mystery involved in writing it too. Uh, I got about six months into, well, let me, let me back up. When I first wrote the story, I wrote it for the times and then I wrote a longer story and then I wrote a series of follow-up stories. And then I wrote a long story for Sarasota magazine that kind of wrapped up the whole thing. And so when I started the book, I thought, well, this will be easy. I don't have to do any additional reporting. And, you know, I started writing it, but as often happens when you start writing, you discover there are more questions that you have. So mm -hmm. I went back to some of the Sarasota people and talked to them. And then finally, somebody said, well, aren't you going to investigate the Peru in? And I went, holy cow. So uh, I started calling people in Peru and talking to them and emailing and so forth. And uh, I got about six months into the, into the working on it and into working on it and talked to one person, a, uh, an orchid grower in Canada who, when I told them what I was calling about, they said, you really don't know anything about this, do you? Oh. <laughs> and I said, and apparently not. Please tell me. <laughs> you know? In retrospect, how much, how, what, what would you rate your percentage of understanding at that point when the Canadian said, you don't, you need to know more? Well, I, I think he was right in that there were aspects of it that I wasn't aware of, that only someone who was an orchid grower would know. Mm -hmm. And so he really helped me to kind of grasp that 
and put it all together. And uh, it was a it was a a humbling but very valuable conversation. Let's put it that way. <laughs> good, good. good. Um, John uh, Bosshart asks, "What was Miss Ms. Lee's argument as the motivation for m- murder versus suicide?" Um, gosh, if I remember right, it was something about money that he had borrowed money mm-hmm. and couldn't pay it back, and uh, this was done as a as a lesson to other people. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. And um, I think we just talked about uh, what caught what a little bit about your motivation well, about the story, but what first caught your attention? Well, it's interesting. I uh, uh, had done a profile story of a guy who uh, was an orchid collector and actually had written uh, illustrated guides to native to the native orchids of Florida and uh, went out orchid hunting with him one day in Brooksville. We, we were in and oh. we were in downtown Brooksville, went to a vacant lot and look, walked through there and spotted at least a dozen wild orchids wow. growing there. And I mean, they were they were tiny, but they were just fascinating little little specimens. And so uh, the and. Profile story is he had written a very critical uh, review of uh, the orchid thief by Susan Orlean, mm-hmm. and uh, it was. It, he just he tore it apart as a, from an, from an orchid collector standpoint, and he had published this. He put out a, a publication called the Native Orchid Society newsletter, and he put his review in that, which you know that went to the subscribers. But then he posted it on Amazon, and that was kind of a new thing then to post reviews on Amazon, and it got all kinds of attention on Amazon because of course the book was a big bestseller. So I wrote this profile story about him going after Susan Orlean. Well, about. A year later, I guess, he called me. He said, listen, I, I really appreciate you doing that nice story on me. Uh, and I just wanted to sort of repay the favor by letting you know about this big thing that's going on in the orchid world. And, I, you know, I'm kind of halfway listening to him at that point because I'm thinking, you know, I'm busy with the Everglades restoration and, and you know, pollution stories and all that kind of stuff. And he said, Selby Botanical Gardens is about to get charged with a crime. And I went, wait, what? <laughs> right, right. Because... <laughs> I, you know, I knew Selby. I had, I used to work in the Sarasota at the Sarasota paper. So I'd written some feature stories about S- Selby gardens down there. And he said, the whole thing, the whole story is spelled out in federal criminal files that are over in Tampa. Go take a look at the file. You will not be sorry. So I went to Tampa, pulled the court files uh, from federal court there and read it over. And, you know, my jaw was just on the floor pretty much the whole time. And the best part was that, uh, the defense attorneys in this case had taken pages from the grand jury report, which would normally be secret, and had copied them and attached them to the various motions. Mm-hmm. So I had access to most of the grand jury report that was leading up to the indictment. And, you know, getting a copies of, of grand jury testimony is rarer than the rarest orchid. And so I actually you know, walk, got copies and walked out of there. And when I got into the elevator, did like a little happy dance, you know, <laughs> <laughs> yay, I got them. And then I realized, wait, there's probably a camera in here. I should stop. Doing it. <laughs> <laughs> probably looking over your shoulder the whole way as you're walking back to the car. Probably so. <laughs> well, that, that is, uh, that's, you know, I, there was a lot of times when people would say to me, oh, well, you know what's going on over at Selby, right? Wink, wink, nod, nod. Yeah. And so there was all these rumors, all this below the surface. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I know what's going on. They're being, you know, smuggling, blah, blah, blah. I never really knew the whole story until I read mm-hmm. your book. Yeah. I really, and and uh, now I feel like I, when people give me that wink, wink, nod, nod, that I have a, a much better <laughs> understanding of the intrigue that went on there. Um, um, John also asks, uh, what were your journalistic methods that, you know, that takes us something from being a newspaper story to being a full, um, a full book? Oh, that's a good question. Um, you know, when you're telling a story for a newspaper, you're just basically giving people the facts. You're not giving them any sort of a context or a sense of, you know, of being in the story. So what you have to do is give them those details. So, uh, I would take an interview that I'd done with someone and I would include with the quotes, I would include, you know, where the interview took place or, you know, what the weather was like, what music might be playing, anything like that, kind of put the reader into the scene and feel like they were there. 
you know, and, and it's not me doing the reporting, but they feel like I'm, I'm in the, I'm the middle of this whole thing and I'm experiencing it. And uh, uh, that seems to be a, a way to, to really help people feel like they're engaged with the story. Cause that's ultimately your goal is to make them feel like I'm invested in this. I want to see how it turns out. I want to see what happens at the end. And which of course is, you know, the great gift of many murder mysteries is they suck you in, you get pulled along by the plot. You're like, Oh my God, what's going to happen to these folks. So that's what I was kind of going for with this nonfiction story. Very good. And uh, Donald DePew um, jumped in and said, um, did this book take more time um, than your other published titles? Oh gosh. Um, I think I, my deadline was about seven months. I had to take, I had to t basically take all the reporting I'd done for the newspaper and the report of reporting I'd done for the magazine story and then flesh all that out into a, a coherent narrative in about seven months. So I had, wow. I had a good starting point, but obviously I had to do a lot more work after that. And some of it was, was some of it was easy. Some of it was really difficult. Um, none of the federal people would talk to me except for the one guy who was the orchid expert for the Fish and Wildlife Service. <clears throat> Everybody else is like, nope, nope, can't talk about it, can't talk about it. So that was very frustrating. That was, the, then, that was Roddy? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was very helpful. He was, he was great. And, um, so I, you know, this is a good question because I had uh, visions of you at a dining room table with, you know, all of the, all of your <laughs> orchid references and all the court documents and, you know, maybe an English to Spanish dictionary trying to figure <laughs> stuff out. Was that a pretty accurate uh, that's, that's not bad. Um, uh, and here was the other thing that happened. And when I did have help from a good friend of mine who is from Peru and was able to help me translate a lot of stuff. Um, the, uh, uh, but the other thing that happened was I ran into uh, a weird roadblock. Um, uh, I wanted a picture of the, the one guy involved in the smuggling and, uh, and he was a, he was a fugitive from justice. You know, he had disappeared from, from the court in Miami. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so I put in a, a freedom of information act request to the U S marshal service. That's the agency that okay. tracks fugitives saying, do you have a photo of him? That's all I want. It's just a photo. Right. Months passed. Nothing. How are you supposed to find somebody without a photo? And then finally, about a month before I was supposed to turn the manuscript in, they finally sent me a response and said, yes, we, we can confirm. We can confirm for you that we have a file on this person and we can release it to you if you get a release from him that says it's okay i'm like well you can't find him how am i supposed to find him <laughs> fortunately fortunately one of my other sources had a picture of the guy and said oh why don't you tell me here here's, here's his picture oh so <laughs> that's good um uh boss Hart also wants to know in your opinion how much of this overall brouhaha was simply because uh kovac was too naive to pay the proper upfront bribes in peru Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think some of that, but some of it too was spurred by the rivalry between Selby and Eric Christensen, the former employee who was going to publish this and name the name the flower for Peru, Fragmapedium uh, Peruvianum. And uh, they are, the rivalry there between the two was just so bitter and so strong that Eric Christensen made a really big deal out of it with everybody he talked to. So that's a lot of what kind of got Selby nailed as well, is that they, they made the mistake of putting out a special issue of their newsletter so they could, they could beat him into print and do a sort of, you know, ha ha, we beat you, we're better. And then it totally backfired on them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if, if only they had called the Fish and Wildlife Service and said, hey, we got a, we got a guy here with a flower that, needs permits and doesn't have permits uh they would have been completely protected and they still could have published the you know the information mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but they were like no no this is ours we're not going to share it with anybody there was a couple yeah. of there was a you know quite a few of those little missteps i mean you know when mm -hmm. he's in the when he's in customs down in miami and i've gone mm -hmm. through i've gone through those customs i've gone through the farm and agriculture line with plants with proper phytosanitary mm -hmm. and, and and they've just waved me for through i'm yeah. like 
hey, and this, I, was, this was right after 9 11 too mm-hmm. when you'd think they'd be at heightened very much heightened security but no he really and then there was the whole it. the the john atwood taking taking one up to vermont that was another big misstep so right that was and did remind me eric christensen's demise in the book um i i I seem to recall it was a heart attack. I'm not sure. I don't remember uh-huh. for sure. But I, he had sort of so isolated himself that he was in the house for several days before right. his letter, before the uh, letter carrier caught on. Yeah. And so, so here, here, this character that's portrayed, this real life person, um, mm-hmm. but kind of portrayed in the book is the, the, the enemy or the bad guy or the, you know, the, the pain um, it, it has this tragic, uh, has this tragic yeah. ending, which was well, kind of sad. And, I, and, and fortunately, I had gone to interview him before that. So I had gotten his side of the story. And, and I don't think of him as the, as the villain at all, because he was making a correct point that what they had done was illegal. And if they didn't do something about it, other people would follow suit and do the same thing. Correct. So, um, uh, but it's very sad. He he had the personality of uh, someone who is very independent and very critical. And so even people that liked him got pushed away from him and got pushed out of his orbit. And that's why he, you know, he, that's why he was found the way he was, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you think that the Peru, uh, if if you think Peru would have made such a big stink if they had just named the plant Peruviana? No, I don't. I think that would have been regarded as, oh, okay, this is fine, you know, yeah. but Kovac, that was the one condition of Kovac handing the plant over to the folks at Selby as they name it after him because he was so jealous of Lee Moore. Right. And do you think Moore kind of pushed him into doing that? I think so too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I do. And, and, uh, but Lee's such a fascinating character. He, he was, uh, he, he died a few years ago and I, I was privileged enough to write his obituary. Uh, and he was just such a colorful character. I think I mentioned, you know, I mentioned in the book that I once uh, called him an orchid smuggler and he got very offended. And he said, oh. I never, I never smuggled orchids. I used orchids to hide what I was really smuggling. <laughs> <laughs> That's a character. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I have this picture here of a little Talancia that is taken in the wild, by the way. Um, and I, I wanted to recant the story and ask other folks about um, their experiences. I was driving from um, from Homestead to, to St. Pete, actually, and I decided to take uh, 41, the Tamiami Trail, so I could go by the Skunk Ape uh, oh, yeah. Museum. And oh, yeah. You got to make, you got to stop off at the Skunk Ape. Uh, got to, re- right? Skunk Ape Research Headquarters. That's right. what they call it. Skunk Ape Research yeah. But it was research a re- <laughs> it was such a blustery day. I think there was a mm-hmm. fragment of a tropical storm out there, but it was a sunny day, but it was a real blustery day. And the bromeliads were flying off of the trees uh, onto the road. And I was in my state vehicle from UF and I really wanted to stop and pick up these plants. <laughs> and because the Talansias were on the ground and they were beautiful. And I'm thinking to myself, they're only just going to get run over. And I could say, well, I'm, I'm with UF and I'm protecting these plants. And then but I know better. I yeah. know better. And I left them. And I'm like, this is somebody else's problem. I do not need to be stopped with picking up plants in the Everglades no. National Park. I'm just going to no. keep on going. <laughs> but my question to the group is, um, have you or maybe a friend, maybe you know a friend that's ever smuggled a plant or maybe uh, collected a plant that wasn't appropriate? So I have um, a funny story about that. <laughs> uh, um, go ahead, Craig. In, uh, I was in St. Augustine a couple of years ago, uh, February 2020. They have a thing called, the, or they used to, the Florida Heritage Book Festival. And every year they declare somebody to be a Florida literary legend. And that year it was my turn. They decided you're going to be a Florida literary legend. Yeah, I know. I don't take it at all seriously. Um, <laughs> you know, you, that designation gets you free parking at every book festival in Florida. That's about it. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but uh, uh, one of my friends, I'm not going to name him for obvious reasons surprised me by showing up there and he had a bag with him and in the bag was a branch off of an orange tree with a few oranges on it okay and he told me that he got this from uh marjorie canan rawlings house which is a state park right (laughs) he had broken a branch off of a tree in a state park and brought it to me i'm like dude this is so illegal you can't this is this is so wrong on so many different levels right (laughs) i know but he thought it was appropriate somehow to bring me an orange from from cross creek i'm like 
so uh, I hid the bag and didn't tell anybody about it, and <laughs> and you know, except all of my Facebook friends. <laughs> and, um, That's uh, funny. I later tried to eat one of the oranges. Oh my god, it was so sour. <laughs> yeah, you probably got some old wildwood orange or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Well, it seems that the the few people that said I'm so we have you know over fifty people on with us today, mm-hmm. and two of them had said no, and I'm going to guess the other forty eight are <laughs> are giving <laughs> are busy us a scrubbing guess. their social media. Yes, <laughs> right, exactly. Um, so, um, but I just I just want folks to think about that, you know, as far as, as you know, it's wrong, but people do it all the time. And that's one of the reasons why we have, um, um, issues in Florida because our, Mm -hmm. our borders are like Swiss cheese. You know, this is how Mediterranean fruit fly gets in. This is how giant, you know, uh, land snails get in. You know, these are, Mm -hmm. these are things that are, um, (laughs) well, (laughs) the giant land snails got in because a religious cult smuggled them in because they thought that (laughs) drinking their mucus would make you feel healthy. And it actually, it actually has the opposite effect. So they all wound up in the ER, which is how the authorities found out. (laughs) Okay. So here, uh, this is what I was, uh, this is the gold that I was digging for. Cheryl says she has a record with the U.S. government because she tried to bring home flower seeds from Monet's garden in Giverny. And she bought them at the gift shop, but they had not been certified. Oh no. And uh, Marla said she wanted to buy. (laughs) Lock her up. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, Mother said she bought flower bulbs or bought wanted to buy bulbs in Netherlands, um, but um, her husband said put them back. He didn't want to go. He didn't want to wait in the agriculture customs line. <laughs> and um, a friend was ashamed of me when she found out I didn't keep a small shovel in the car. Uh, but she was talking about <laughs> side of the road finds. I probably oh never my. thought about picking up something in a protected area. Yeah. <laughs> And that's good that you didn't think about that. (laughs) That's good. Well, I just, I hope that we all can help to educate our friends when they do Mm -hmm. so that, you know, it's the wrong thing to do because a lot of times we could potentially be bringing in pests or disease as well as invasive plants. Yeah. We don't need any more greening, citrus greening or anything like that. No, we don't. Um, So I I just wanted to talk a little bit about the investigative reporting um, Mm -hmm. aspect of this. Um, You know, did you did you ever uh, have a stakeout for this book or others? Um, You know, where did you ever feel your safety was in um, in um, peril when you were doing interviews or um, uh, did you have any? Um, parking, uh, parking garage moments where uh, information was shared to you. The cigarette smoking man. Uh, no, yeah, no, exactly. No, none so, of that. No, I mean, the, the, the reality is much more prosaic than the way it's depicted in movies and TV. I mean, it's, it's slogging through lots of, lots of records, talking to people, tracking someone down to, to find them to talk to um, and persuading them to talk to you. And that's, you know, that's pretty much it. Uh, it's, uh, you know, you don't meet in a parking garage with, with sources and you don't uh you don't stake out houses um but uh, for the most part i mean uh, you know it happens occasionally but most of my investigative reporting was just talking to people and because somebody out there knows the story somebody out there knows the secret somebody has access to the paperwork and the folks in particularly the folks at selby gardens were just dying to tell somebody about what had happened there and about the internal dissension over what to do with the orchid and then the how the whole trust the one kind of wrinkle i guess was uh initially how can i put this initially meg loman the director of the garden at the time was very forthcoming with me but then suddenly she stopped and she said i have a great idea what if we wrote the book together Mm. because she had already written a couple of books and i said well i have already got a contract for me to be the one author on this and um because i could see her kind of co-oping co- you know taking over the book and so it paints it as you know saint meg saves Sylvie. and uh and so once i said no to being a partner with her on it she kind of cut me off so got uh, quiet and yeah then, then you said in the book some of the other players were thinking about writing books one gave up and one was still trying or yeah, nobody um, else ever did. Nobody else ever did. And I'm glad I did it when I did, because um, uh, Kovac has since died. Uh, 
uh, you know, I mentioned Eric Christensen has died, died after I interviewed him and some of the other folks who are, are just no longer and around. Lee Moore so, is gone too. Lee, right? Lee Moore is gone too. Yeah. So a lot of the people who knew the story, including those two main ones, Lee and Michael Kovac are both no more. So. Right. Well, good, good, good answer. Um, and then we've already asked you a little bit about uh, what the investigative process looked like. And I think you just answered that. Um, so I don't know if you wanted to I say mean, anything. Well, I mean, the big thing is, uh, you know, once I got hold of the legal of the court records, that was a big part of it. And the um, I was actually there for the courtroom showdown at the end. The, you the were. Yeah, the sentencing, the sentencing there. But it was it was in a courtroom that was huge and the acoustics were terrible. And so I, you know, I, I was able to get some of it and take notes and write a daily story about what the sentencing results were. But when it came time to write about it in a book, I ended up contacting the attorneys involved and saying, do you guys have a transcript of the sentencing yeah. hearing? And fortunately, one of them was willing to let me borrow his transcript. I had to give it back. But I, that way I could get the official transcript of what was said during the hearing, the whole conversation between the judge and the attorneys and everything. And that made a big difference as far as being able to really flesh out that scene. So Kovac's story changed quite a bit. You know, mm -hmm. there was so many different versions. I can't even. At I, least three, I think. At least yeah. three. And so do you think the final version that w took place in that hearing was the, the real story? Mm, I, I'm not even sure he knew what was real right. by that okay. point. You know, he had told so many different versions that uh, trying to make himself look good. So I, I don't know. Uh, sometimes I think what he told the Washington Post is the originally is, is, is the is the correct version, because usually the first version people tell that's the that's the one that's true. Good to know. Good to know. And in that regard, um, I'm sure while you were um, investigating and interviewing people, people lied probably right to your face. Oh, yeah. And how do you handle that? Um, the, the way I handle it usually if, is if, if there's not some document that will tell you what really happened, then to just present them both and let the reader decide and say, this is what this person says and this is what this person says. And, you know, you, you decide which one seems more credible. Right. Well, I think it was probably the, the third version of Kovac's story somewhere about maybe two thirds into the book, I was like, Hey, he's, this is, this is different. There's a lot. And so I really like mm -hmm. the way that you let the reader kind of determine that. I like yeah. that. That was really fun. Thanks. That's good. All right. So I, I want to um, remind you all that we have been working on our books uh, for, um, for the Master Gardener Book Club. And Craig, this kind of came out of COVID um, just because we were all at, staying at home and needed something sure. to do. And, and uh, books are great, uh, a great escape and a <laughs> great way to educate ourselves as well. So mm -hmm. this was... Um, this was our one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, our ninth book. So wow. um, we're very impressive. Very happy to have you uh, mm -hmm. in our group. And I'm going to um, ask anybody else if they have questions for you. And then I'm going to ask them if they have any recommendations for our next book. So Donald uh, says, uh, so does Craig raise any orchids? I have a brown thumb and I'm not ashamed to admit it, <laughs> Okay, but I, I, I enjoy looking at orchids. I, I try not, I try to avoid even touching them though, because I just know one touch can kill. <laughs> I'm just that bad with flowers. <laughs> uh, we can, we can try. And what about, um, what about uh, any movie studios calling you about this? No. And I, you know, I think it's just because it's a very complicated story. And, and uh, I mean, look what they did with uh, the orchid thief. They, they ended up having to come up with a fake ending in order to, to sort of make the point of the story of this flower is not nearly exciting enough to be a movie. So I think, right. well, I yeah, think they, this one's sort of in the same category. That movie, <laughs> that movie was not about the orchid, unfortunately. No. no. Um, so um any other questions for um, Craig? I think John put one in here earlier. Let me see what he had. Um, yeah, he said, would you characterize the uh, Lee Moore Kovac style orchid collectors as treasure hunters? That's a good comparison. Yeah, uh, uh, you know, but I, um, I'm going to put this. The, the one difference, I guess, is motivation in that treasure hunters are, at, are strictly in it for the money. 
but the uh, Lee was really passionate about plants and passionate specifically about orchids and bromeliads. And, uh, you know, it, when he said I was using the orchids to hide what I was really smuggling, it's true. He used orchids to hide the Mexican antiquities, pre-Columbian uh, uh, antiquities that he was actually smuggling. But he was passionate about finding these interesting plants out in the jungle and then getting them named for him. And uh, he, he was just a fascinating character, an interesting guy to talk to. Um, the only, the only hard part about talking to Lee was you couldn't shut him up once he started talking. <laughs> he got, I was covering the, uh, 2010 BP oil spill in Pensacola and trying to, I'd be, you know, I'd go out to the beach and cover what was happening that day with the oil spill and the cleanup. And then I, I'd, I'd go to the nearest McDonald's because that's a place with free Wi-Fi and, and free refills and clean bathrooms. And I would sit there and I'd be writing my story and my phone would ring and it'd be Lee. Hey, if something else occurred to me, I just want to tell you. About it. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking, really now? Okay, sure. So, you know, I'd talk to him for an hour and say, Lee, I got to go. My deadline's coming. I got to go. Okay, I'll call you. I'll call you tomorrow. <laughs> you know, it's like, right. Okay. right. <laughs> when you turn the faucet on, it's hard to turn that faucet off. And, and, like and so, so when, uh, when the sin of scandal came out, uh, one of the places that I went to talk about it was in Miami, specifically to Books and Books, the famous independent bookstore there in Coral Gables. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I got another author, a guy named Mike Grunwald, to introduce me uh, for that. And Lee showed up at, oh my <laughs> at, oh my the, gosh. at the book signing so he could sign copies as well. Oh, my and, gosh. <laughs> and, and he wanted he wanted my he wanted me to be sure I knew that if Hollywood did call, he was available to play himself in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's excellent. That's yeah. excellent. What a great story. Um, so uh, Stacy wanted to know, um, she, <laughs> her question was, when is, what is the difference between smuggling and just taking a cutting? And I, I, um, I, you don't Hiding have it. to answer that, Craig. I'll say when Hiding you cross, it. <laughs> when you Hiding cross, it and making uh, a profit off of it. Yeah. <laughs> when you cross political lines or when you cross uh, national lines, it could mm -hmm. be smuggling, but uh, just taking a cutting is actually known as stealing. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I had a friend uh, in the chat box here ask if, um, if you have been back to Selby Gardens recently. Uh, you know, believe it or not, the Selby, uh, uh, Orchid Society invited me to come speak to them about the Sun of Scandal at, and they meet at Sobe Gardens. And I said, will I be okay to come in? And they mm -hmm. said, yeah, yeah, it's fine. It's fine. And um, uh, so I went in and did my presentation on it. And it was very, it was a very quiet group, uh, except for, um, and I'm drawing a blank on his name, the guy who had been the president of the board of trustees. Um, Kelly? Yes. Yes. He was there and he had, he had numerous questions to ask. But in the end, he said, you know, the, the book was accurate as far as he was concerned. He didn't like his portrayal in the book, but he, it was the tone that he objected to more than any facts in the book. So that was, a, that was kind of an interesting experience to deal with. But yeah, so I, I have definitely been back to Selby since then. Um, and I, I, I didn't put this in the book, but let me just mention the folks at Selby, when I first started writing it, I contacted them and said, I'm going to be writing a book and Selby Gardens is the setting for a lot of it can I come take a, a tour of the place? And they actually gave me a backstage tour. And this was not too long after the whole thing had, you know, kind of blown up blown in their over. faces. And, and so while I was there, they were trying to shift, over, shift away from orchids and over to African violence. Uh -huh. And so one of the scientists there, the guy who was in charge of the African violet program, actually had a bumper sticker that said, ask me about my gisneriads. And I said, I, I, I don't want to sound flippant, but do people ask you about your Gisneriads? And he's, <laughs> his shoulders kind of slump. And he said, no, everybody thinks it's a disease. <laughs> ask me about my Gisneriads. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's good. Yeah. Find the cure for Gisneriads. <laughs> That's good. Um, Frida brings up a really interesting point. She says, you know, um, she enjoyed it as a mystery th thriller, the book. And but now she's wondering about uh, other botanical gardens that she's familiar with, wondering if they've been in hot water, because we know this cannot be an isolated incident. In fact, you know, there, there was a huge case made in the book that you wrote, you know, that this is kind of going on all over the place and everybody mm -hmm. turns a blind eye or, or just are maybe 
execute a little smarter, the bribes are paid, the, the paperwork is filed, what have you, but um, what would you well, say about that? I, I think you're right to wonder about it. I mean, the thing with Selby is this was an incredibly prominent case, an incredibly prominent uh, orchid. And that's why they became the first scientific institution in America to be prosecuted for wildlife trafficking. But if it had been something small and less spectacular, would have flown right under the radar. And, uh, you know, if, and Peru wouldn't have made a complaint probably. And, uh, it, you know, it was just, it was, it was a combination of circumstances that this particular orchid was such a big deal that it, you know, it just, it, they, they screwed up. They got so excited. They didn't think about what the downside could be. And they'd been doing it for so long that there hadn't been a downside. I mean, it's a, it's an unpopular law among, among folks who deal with these things. Mm -hmm. And it was very lightly enforced up to that point. Lightly so, enforced. And then yeah. and they chose to make kind of an example of everybody involved. Yeah. Especially um, I felt, I felt really bad for Wesley Higgins. Yeah. Because, it wasn't equitable, was it? You know? No, he wound up facing a, a greater penalty than Kovac did, you know, right. and, but he's bounced back. He's doing better. So. Good. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. yeah. Well, our last comment is from Jane Palmer, and she said the book was terrific, Craig. Thanks for writing such an interesting and exciting story about the true story of a mysterious and beautiful flower. Oh, that's so, very nice. It's Have you considered writing book blurbs? Because you'd be good at it. That's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jane, I thank you for the perfect blurb. And Craig, thank you for a wonderful book club wrap up. I really appreciate it. And we look forward to your next title. What are you working on? I am working on a book about pythons awesome. uh, and the, the working title is The Snake That Swallowed Florida. Perfect. Perfect. Well, thank, thank you so much. Uh, we, uh, we look forward to the next read and we really appreciate you joining us for the book club wrap up. So happy to do thank it. Thank you. And All right. we'll see you next time. I'll start listening to your podcast. Yes. Well, it's called Welcome to Florida. And, and the, the, the idea is 900 new people move here every day and nobody tells them what they've gotten themselves into. So we're trying to fill that gap. <laughs> very good very good thank you so much we'll take right. care bye-bye bye-bye